Hello and welcome to our daily Bible reading. It's great to have you with me today and thank you for joining with others around not just Australia but around the world actually. So welcome to you who are watching in other parts of the world. No matter where you are, I really appreciate you coming on this journey. We're looking through, continuing through the book of Isaiah and then through John chapter 11 which I'll have some, some background comments to make about that as well. Let's pray. Father, I, I ask that in this world of so many devices, digital watches and digital phones and all the digital distractions that enter into our world that make it difficult for us just to stop, just to pause and just to reflect. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at your word now, you would still our hearts and fill people's minds with the peace of Christ that surpasses comprehension. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly, no one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adders' eggs, they weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies, and from one that is crushed a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. And there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight among those. In full vigour we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him, that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. So the prophet has identified the exact reason why people do not 
enjoy the presence of God, do not experience the presence of God, do not experience all the blessings that come from the presence of God, which includes peace and joy and a sense of forgiveness. Because their sins have separated, their transgressions have separated them from God. And this is, this is what we might call an eternal truth because it doesn't matter that this is old covenant, this is just a truth because even in the new covenant, even today, people's sin separates them from God. This is the human problem. This is the problem that only the gospel solves, that Christ came and he, he breached that gap. He met the, he, he is the mediator between God and man and he now offers us his righteousness so that we can enter into the presence of God and enjoy all the blessings of the presence of God. And I pray that we will actually enjoy the, those blessings. This is Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. They shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar. And I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, the silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. Foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favour I have had mercy on you. Your gates shall be open continually, day and night, they shall not be shut. The people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Saviour, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace, and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation, and your gates praise. The sun shall no more be your light. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. And while there are many people that believe this speaks of some kind of millennial restoration of Jerusalem, I am inclined to see that this is what Revel that the book of Revelation describes actually as the ultimate 
the ultimate uh, place of of the redeemed and and this is poetic language for that and it talks about the the new city the heavenly jerusalem coming down and it talks about a new heaven and new earth and i'm going to make the case that it's not a new heaven and a new earth but it's a new heaven and earth and this is describing that glory john chapter 11 now this uh, one of the things in reading john is that it may not be immediately apparent that what we're dealing with is essentially nine days out of the life of christ nine days and what's happened what what we're about to read now is, and the other Gospels reveal that Jesus has already taken his disciples after three and a half years of being with them. He's taken them to Caesarea Philippi. We read about this in Matthew chapters 16 and 17 and Mark chapters 8 and 9. And it's there that he asks them, who do men say that I am? And that's where Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And from that point, he announces to them, I'm going to Jerusalem now and I'm going to die. I'm going to be handed over to the, the, the high priest, the rulers, the, and so on, and they will hand me over to the Romans and, and I will be killed. And this is quite bewildering for them, for his disciples, because they don't get, this is not the Jewish expectation. The Jewish expectation is Messiah will defeat the enemies. He will he will vanquish the Romans. But this is not what Christ is talking about. And from Caesarea Philippi, Christ makes his way down in, back into Galilee and wanted to go into Samaria, but they, they actually said, no, no, you can't stay here. He goes now down to Bethany. And so this is where we are, Bethany, just a couple of miles and literally two miles away to the east of Jerusalem. And we, we pick up the, the story having that Christ is in Galilee. He's had word, Lazarus is ill. He has not responded. And we'll, we'll see this in the text. And after four days, knowing that Lazarus has died, he now makes his way to Bethany. So let's have a look at this. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Ah, oh, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Oh, well, let us go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So this revelation was now being made known to others, not just Peter, as, we, as we've just pointed out. It was just prior to this that Peter received the same revelation from God. And the New Testament places women in a, a very, very um, prominent role and a prominent role of, of incredible dignity and showing that, that the equality between men and women is, is grounded in the image of God. So it's a, it's a beautiful expression happening here. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Now, we're not told, <laughs> we're told once Jesus wept. We're not told that the same thing would have happened after he was deeply moved again, but chances are, it was. Chances are he, he was weeping. And, and it sounds like in the text that, that what the Jews surmised was happening was probably why he was weeping. He wept because, oh boy, if I'd only been here, I could have raised him. And he's weeping about that. But that's clearly not true. That clearly cannot be because he's already told his disciples what he's going to do. He's already told his disciples Lazarus is dead. So he knew this. And it's not a cold-hearted thing. But in one sense... I'm going to draw upon what my hero F.W. Borum says of this text because for me it makes the most sense. Jesus is standing outside the tomb of Lazarus. We're about to see that he, he commands, take the stone away. And as he stands there, there's Martha weeping, there's, there's Mary upset, there's the Jews around him upset, and he weeps. And F.W. Borum says, not because Lazarus had died, not because he hadn't been there, not because he could have changed the situation, but Jesus wept because of what he was about to do. Because he was the only one who knew where Lazarus really was. So it's a kind of a question of irony when he says, show me where you've laid him, as if he was there. He wasn't there, that was his body. Jesus knew where Lazarus was and he was in a place called paradise. Free from pain, free from trouble, <laughs> free from the cares of this world where there's no more sighing, no more pain, no more tears. And Jesus was about to bring him from that place back into this dimension, back into his body, resuscitate his body. And because of that, F.W. Borum says, Jesus wept. If you're a preacher who ever has to take a funeral, remember that thought. Hardly a funeral goes by where I don't recite this account from F.W. Borum's perspective, and I just think it's a beautiful thought that Jesus knew where Lazarus was, and the thought of bringing him back to this life, he wept. That tells you something about what awaits the believer. But in the meantime, it's important that we see out our days here to the glory of God. So we, we continue. Jesus said, take away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, you know, I would expect that, the, that this would go. Many of the Jews who were there rejoiced and said, he really is the Messiah. He really is the Christ. Bewilderingly, that's not how the text is about to read. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Praise God. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own account, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. It's a, an amazing response from the religious leaders to be so hard-hearted, so hard-hearted. And it highlights their spiritual apostasy. It, it just highlights how far away from God they were. And the, the challenge for us, the application for us, is that we won't be, that we will be a people whose hearts are open, are open to God, soft-hearted, and may God make that happen. In fact, let's pray that, that that's what's going to result from us reading this now that we see the glory the power of christ that our hearts would be full of awe and adoration for him let's pray father i, I do I, I pray for my heart that my heart won't become complacent well, i won't take for granted what christ has done for me for us and i pray for those who are joining with me now today that that their hearts also will be soft soft towards you full of adoration awe and worship for who you are and for what you've done for us. May today we live with a greater sense of appreciation and awe and adoration of Christ. And I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with me today. Please give us a thumbs up. If you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe. Got a question, comment, got your own reflection, leave it there in the comment section and you'll see me tomorrow for our next Daily Bible.